Welcome to all of you as we gather around God's Word this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus. Uh, today is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany, but today we have a, a special focus um, as our Stewardship Sunday. Um, how, um, in view of God's mercy, God gives us the opportunity to offer ourselves uh, it, with our, our own bodies, our time, our talents, our ministries, our treasures, uh, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to the Lord, holy and pleasing to Him. And so uh, we'll have in our focus um, what, what that really is all about. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we are placing our sealed pledges up here on the altar as our annual um, stewardship planning campaign. Really, what is this all about? Why do we do that? Why do we have you come up here, place them in the offering plates on the altar or there on the floor level. Why do we have you consider this or fill these out? Many of you are longtime members. You've been doing this for years. You kind of know the process. You know what it's all about. Some of you, um, maybe you've heard about it and you came to church and you said, oh, that's happening today. Um, and you kind of wonder all, what this is all about. Some of you, you know, maybe you're visiting with us. You have no idea. You don't have the least clue, and you didn't even know this was happening today. D rest assured, it's okay. Um, but what is this all about? Why are we doing this? And some of you might be dreading it a little bit and thinking, oh, great, another sermon about money. Church is going to be asking for money, and you're really thrilled about that. Rest assured, that's not what this sermon is about. That's not what this day is about. And that's not what these sealed pledges are about, even though, yeah, it kind of looks a lot like that. And maybe you're even wondering, well, when you consider these sealed pledges and what you want to commit and set aside to give as offerings to the Lord, what is the right thing to do? What percentage should you give? What is the right amount? What is the offering that is going to be God-pleasing? Honestly, it's easy for us to think along those lines. On the one hand, maybe to dread a little bit a sermon in which we talk or discuss money in any way, but to be honest, if, if we don't talk about money for a whole year as a congregation, we're not really being faithful to what God's Word says. Jesus addressed the topic quite frequently, and, um, and he was quite pointed and direct about it. So if we're going to be faithful to the Word of God, we have to discuss the topic. And in another way, it, it's very easy for us to fall into thinking that, okay, what do I have to do to make myself pleasing to the Lord? How can my offerings be? What is the right amount? What is the right percentage to give? What can I do so that my offerings are pleasing in God's sight and I am acceptable to Him? It's really easy for human beings to fall into that line of thinking. In honesty, we are people who prefer to have laws and rules to follow. We like having guidelines. We like setting goals for ourselves. We like being able to track those goals. We like to have goals that are, what do they say, smart? I don't know the whole um, smart um, you know, analogy, but you know, is it, uh, is it uh, specific, measurable, attainable, that sort of thing? You'd be able to track your progress and everything and say, okay, I'm on track and and we can very easily get into our minds that if I just do enough, keep up with the goals and do this specific goal and obligation, keep up with that, then God will be happy with me. The sinful nature, in truth, likes to have laws to follow. The sinful nature is a rule follower. It is a law maker. Because we each have in us ingrained this mentality that there is something I can do, some way that I can live, something I can contribute, some way that I can behave by which I can make myself pleasing 
to God and acceptable to God. The truth is that there isn't. We can set laws and rules for ourselves to follow. We can try our hardest by our own standards, by our own personal lives of piety, by our own goals with offerings. We can do our very best and try our hardest. We can even make personal um, you know, righteousness or purity laws or goals for ourselves that are specific and measurable, but they will never be attainable. If you really want to measure up to God's righteousness and holiness and what he demands and expects from you, it's not possible for any one of us. You can give your entire paycheck. It's not going to buy you a room in the heavenly mansions above. Now, when we think about this, maybe your mind turns to, for example, the, the Pharisees and those strict adherences they had to so many laws. For example, in, in the New Testament times and how Jesus was always railing on the Pharisees for putting this burden of these laws and man-made rules and obligations on the people. And why didn't they just figure it out? <laughs> it's by grace we're saved and, and we don't live according to laws. But honestly, we can maybe sympathize with the Pharisees a little bit with people of that time because they had seen their people go so wrong and so off the rails that God actually sent the Babylonians and took the whole nation into captivity and destroyed their city of Jerusalem and their temple. And then finally, after 80 years or 70 years, they returned and they had to start all over again. They had been through a whole mess of problems in the intertestamental period from 400 to, to the, the turn of the new century into the first century A.D. And we can understand why the Jews would have wanted to keep themselves pure and separate, to say, okay, what's the right way to live and how are we going to stop what happened before from happening again and make sure that we are on the right page with God? So maybe we can understand, as ridiculous as it sounds, what exactly is a Sabbath day walk? How many steps are you allowed to take on the Sabbath before it constitutes work? Everybody had to get out their Fitbits and keep track of the steps they took and no more and no less than a trip to the synagogue and back. You can understand every little minute detail of the laws and law keepers and law doing and keeping and they thought they could maybe measure their progress by that and if we do it all right and do it well enough and try our best, we'll be acceptable to God. But it's all a lie. It's a lie sold to us by our sinful nature. There's nothing you and I can do to live up to God's righteousness, his purity, to make ourselves acceptable to him. No offering or sacrifice you can make by which you can buy or earn God's favor. The Apostle Paul talks about that in his letter to the Romans. He spends the first two and a half chapters of this letter making that point abundantly clear that if you want to get right with God, there's nothing you can do on your own. It doesn't matter what segment of the population you fall in. If you're a person who was not born and raised with the word of God, if you're, if you're as Paul calls, you know, the pagans and, and you just don't want anything to do with religion, he says, well, people like that are held accountable to God all the same. They still don't live according to God's standards and what they might know about God and obey and follow, they don't even keep that. And people tend to fall worse and worse into more and more horrible sin, especially as you go generations down the line. And then he goes on to people who, who try to keep themselves morally upright and, and be rule followers and say, I'm, I'm a pretty good moral person or I try to be a moral person. And Paul says, well, that doesn't get you off the hook either because even if you have your own standard of morality and doing what is good and right, you don't even keep your own standard. You don't live up to that. Maybe you can think of it occasions in your life where you judge people harshly but are a little bit too easy on yourself. And you say, how, how dare those people do something like that? And you might be guilty of the very same thing and you just don't even think about it or realize it and say, well, yeah, maybe I do that, but you know, I have a good reason for that. So he says, well, it's hypocritical and you're still held by your own standard of morality accountable to God, let alone God's standard. 
And if you are raised as Jewish people, he says in, in the second chapter, as people who had the word of God, who had the law of God, whom God revealed himself to, and you know everything that he wants, you fall way too short of that. And that whole system of the law and the old covenant was, was a back-breaking burden on you that you were never able to keep and never live up to. And in the end, Paul says, finally, why do we have the law? It's so that the whole world can be a, held accountable to God and so that through the law we become conscious of our sin and we have no answer before God. Paul then goes on in the next three chapters in Romans to spell out that your righteousness before God is not earned or deserved by you. It is something that is given freely by his grace that even though none of you, none of us here measures up to the perfect standard of holiness set by God, he has justified you, freed you, forgiven you freely by the grace of God through the righteousness that came by Christ Jesus that in Jesus Christ, he has showered you with forgiveness. He has freed you from the obligation to the law. He has given you his own righteousness as a gift by faith that is purely your own. It is perfect. It is complete. And nothing needs to be added to that. This grace is extended to all, to the entire world, and it is received by us personally by faith in Jesus Christ, not by doing ourselves, but by a simple childlike trust in what Jesus has already done. This is how you are to view your lives before God. It is in view of God's mercy. That's what Paul points out when he gets to chapter 12 and he sums it all up. How should we live before God? He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Everything that you do, Every minute of your life that you live, every hour, every day of your life is something where you are in God's mercy. This is God's undeserved love, what he has done for you, his grace that extends for you, not because of who you are or what you've done, but because he is a loving and gracious God. This mercy is showered upon you. It is mercy he has extended to you. Really, Paul uses the plural in view of God's mercies. Mercy that began from eternity when he looked at you in time ahead and, and planned and predestined you unto eternal life to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. It was God's mercy that said, I love you and I'm going to give my own beloved Son up for you. I'm going to sacrifice him so that you can be my own and ch children conformed to the likeness of my Son, holy and pleasing to me. It was God's mercy that brought Jesus down from his throne in heaven to offer his entire life as an act of obedience in your place. It was God's mercy that had Jesus go through his intense suffering from his anguish in the garden all the way to the agony of the cross to his death expiring groan and his burial. It is God's mercy by which this same Jesus Christ, raised from the dead and seated at God's right hand with all power and authority over everything, still looks upon you and his whole church on earth with favor and, and works all of human history for the good of his church, for the good of believers. It is God's mercy that he has brought this saving gospel message to you and the Holy Spirit has planted Christ in your heart by faith, and that he raises you in this faith and keeps you in this faith until life's end. Basically, your whole life through, you walk through as baptized children of God, you walk through life every moment of every day with a sunshine of righteousness and God's mercy everywhere you go. Maybe you think about cartoons sometimes that have like the unfortunate bad day where the rain cloud follows the person around everywhere they go. They go inside, here's the rain cloud, gloomy and dripping on them. Jesus' mercy is kind of the same way, but without the rain and the gloom. It's a beam of sunshine that follows you everywhere you go, whether you are awake or asleep, whether you are sick or healthy, whether you are old or young, whatever you do, wherever you go, however you live, 
this radiance of God's glory and his mercy, forgiveness, eternal life and salvation, his grace shines upon you. You live and exist and move in God's mercy. That's what your whole life is. So you don't make yourself holy and acceptable and pleasing to God, but through faith in Jesus Christ, for his sake, you are declared to be holy and pleasing in God's sight. Really, he gives you true freedom in the gospel. Freedom from the law and an obligation to keep the law in order to serve and, and live up to God's standard and try to please him. You are free from your sin. Though you still sin every day, you are freed from your sin. They are thrown into the depths of the sea and you're never held accountable as far as punishment, eternal punishment for them. God will never punish you for your sins. You are free from death. Even though you will die someday, you share in the victory that Jesus has over death so that it becomes just a slumber from which you will awake to an everlasting life in heaven. You are free from the power of the devil. He's not your slave master. Though he has power and he can tempt you and he's dangerous still, yet he's not your master. You don't have to listen to him. You can drive him away with a single word. And you are free for a life of being holy and pleasing to God. Your whole life is handed back to you, freed in the gospel. It doesn't matter what you do or how you live or what percentage you put down on this sheet today or even if you put anything up there at all. You are freed and you are holy and pleasing to God all the same through faith in Jesus Christ. So what do you do with all this freedom, with your whole life now given back to you as a gift? Does that mean, okay, that's what I needed to hear. Let's go and live it up. All the temptations I struggled with, I'm not going to worry about those. I'm just going to stop worrying about them and go and live and give in to all those temptations. I'm going to sin it up. I'm going to live my life the whole party lifestyle. I'm just going to forget about everything else. I can do whatever I want. Well, no. Paul isn't talking to pigs here. And you're not pigs. This is what pigs do. Just after they get washed, they run right back to the mud and filth to wallow in it and to get even filthier than they were before. And you say, what's the point of that? But you are children of God. And Paul says, in view of God's mercy, since you are children who are already holy and pleasing to God, he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. He says, you are holy and pleasing to God, so be what you are. Be holy and pleasing to God. And so he says, <laughs> um, do not conform any more to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't go back into the filth from which you were redeemed and freed, but live your whole life now as a living sacrifice and offering holy and pleasing to God, which is what you really are. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, truth be told, offerings aren't really something that do any good for God whatsoever. You know, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to money, when it comes to your time and your talents and your treasures, God's not going to benefit one bit from it. You can give your entire paycheck to the Lord this year. You can give none of your paycheck to the Lord and God is still going to do his work with or without you. Now I know the Board of Stewardship guys are getting nervous with me saying that and our treasurer is freaking out. Don't say that, Pastor. People might actually do that. But it's true. God's going to continue the work of the gospel. He's going to do the work of his kingdom with or without you, however much or little you give, however much or little you contribute to the congregation. God doesn't need your offerings. God doesn't need your service. God doesn't need your time and your abilities and your talents. He doesn't. What difference does it make for him? But Paul directs you rather to where these things should be turned. Even though God doesn't need them, your neighbor definitely does need them. 
And so he uses this very apt and beautiful illustration of the body with many members and many different parts that our service to God is really works of love that are turned outward from ourselves and turned toward our fellow man, toward our neighbor, which is the people God has placed in your lives. Stewardship has a very vocational aspect in that regard, that God has given you people and a neighbor in your life to serve and to love and to live your life as a living sacrifice to them. And so we go to this illustration of the body. Paul says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body with each member, each member belongs to all the others. As baptized children of God, you are all different, varied, and unique members of God's body. You think about the body, all these different parts, fingers and toes, very different, even from each other, extremely different from liver and kidneys, different from lungs and heart, different from skin, from fat tissue, from muscle tissue, from bone tissue, and all everything else in between, yet all their very different functions and parts work together for the good of the body as a whole. That's what a family of believers is. And in your lives, each of you has a unique vocation in which God gives you an opportunity to turn outward from yourself and in Christian freedom to serve one another in love with your time, with your abilities, with your treasures, with your talents, and all these other things. Because even if God doesn't need them, like we said, your neighbor definitely needs them and benefits from them. Paul says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Instead, think of yourself with sober-minded judgment. It's very American for us to think of ourselves as totally independent, as, as completely um, independent, not, not relying on anyone or anything else. I'm pretty self-sufficient. But how self-sufficient are you really? versus how much you depend on the service from other people. What if the county commission just decided in the middle of February, we're done plowing the roads, um, done with this snow, or we're done with it as much as you are, and we're just not going to send out the plows anymore. You think you'd notice a difference driving on the roads? You think it'd be a little more treacherous and nasty going out there and dealing with all this? What if the health department just said, yeah, we're going to stop doing the garbage pickup. No more garbage service. How long would it take for all that garbage to pile up still until it started to become a real problem for you and, quite frankly, a health problem? What if all the hospitals closed? What if the grocery stores closed up? What if the providers for the grocery stores stopped? What if your employer stopped giving you a paycheck? What if your um, customers in your business stop making use of your business at all. And pretty quickly, you see where this is going. You would say, yeah, we actually are pretty dependent on a lot of services and other people in our lives. We depend on them for our life and, and our being and existence. All these are masks that God wears to give you your daily bread and everything you need and in the same way, God has made you daily bread and someone else, you are a mask that God wears in society and toward your neighbor to turn outward from yourself and turn in love to your neighbor in service and charity towards them. And so, where do offerings come into all of this? Well, even your money, these are gifts that God gives you. And Yes, it's true, it's not the greatest of all of God's gifts. Martin Luther says it's got to be one of the least because he even gives it to fools. But it is a gift nonetheless. And just as your time, your abilities, are opportunities for service and love toward one another, so also are, is your money. And a lot of that, in a vocational aspect, is given and pointed and directed towards your family and those closest to you. The proverbial bread on the table, right? The roof over the head to take care of them, to provide their daily needs, to provide education, to provide support and, and care, health care, and, and all these other things that we depend on for body and life. 
And some of your money, God directs you to give what you owe every last cent to the government as revenue and taxes, even though we might think, well, they don't use it all that efficiently or maybe even for all that good of purposes. That's not your concern as much as giving what you owe to the government, which God says, whether you voted for him or not, federal, state, and local, they are God's servants that he gives for your good, whether you realize it or not. Some offerings you give to charity, you give to people as you have opportunity and need to help them out, and so also offerings to church. St. Mark is ground zero for carrying out the Great Commission in this part of the world. You are ground zero for people who will show love and support and, and Christian godliness and, and Christian Christ-like love toward one another. You are the ones who carry out the Great Commission here. And your offerings have that vocational aspect. As people who appreciate the gospel and live in God's mercy, you say it's good to have lights on and heating and a place where we can all gather week in and week out to receive the gospel in word and sacrament. You serve one another, all your believers across seas, over across the United States, over in sub-Saharan Africa, in China, in Northern Europe, in Brazil, and all these Christians throughout the world they depend on you to fulfill the Great Commission here, even as you depend on them to carry the gospel to those distant places. Your offerings serve one another and in a vocational way you provide for your pastors too. You say, we treasure the gospel so much that we want our pastors to dedicate their full time and energy to bringing us the gospel in word and sacrament week in and week out, to instructing our youth and adult confirmands to, to helping out our, our sick and, and ministering to our sick and our dying, to, to administer the keys on behalf of the congregation. And we appreciate this ministry of the gospel so much. We're going to give you a living wage and salary so that you can provide for your family. I'll be honest, if I didn't get a penny from you, I'd probably want to be doing this anyway. But in Christian love, you say, we're going to support you anyway because we want your full time and effort to be committed to the gospel ministry. And so I am a recipient of that love and, and service from the vocation of your money too. And Pastor Prawl is. And all the teachers are, by which you say, it's the same thing with Christian education. We so greatly treasure Christian education at a primary level that we'll do the same for our Christian day teachers and provide for them so they can focus on teaching our children God's word. And all of it, dear friends, is part of a living sacrifice that you offer yourselves to God, holy and pleasing. That's what these are all about. That's what we're doing today. Not because you have to, not under obligation, and there's no right or wrong percentage to give, you are free in the gospel, dear friends. You are God's holy and dearly loved children, holy and pleasing in his sight. And with that mindset, you give of yourselves to the Lord. Be holy and pleasing to God, because that's what you are. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.